Welcome everyone to this webinar on sustainable installation choices, one of the learning modules on the fabric and structure of net zero build projects, which is part of our uh, wider low carbon learning program that's been delivered by Built Environment Smarter Transformation. This program is funded by Skills Development Scotland as part of the National Transition Training Fund with the aim to support those working in the industry to develop more green skills. I'm Sam Patterson, an Associate Impact Manager at BEST, in our sustainability team, and today we will be discussing how to make smart insulation choices and look at the benefits of natural and circular insulation materials. With us today, we have Mark Lane. Mark is a board member of the Alliance of Sustainable Building Products and is the chair of the Natural Fibre Insulation Group. On this group, he represents his company, Eden Renewable Innovations, that produces the thermofleece range of sheep's wool insulation. We also have Dr. Julio Bros Williamson. Julio is a Chancellor's Fellow in Net Zero Buildings at the University of Edinburgh and has been supporting Build Environment Smart Transformation in the development of our training content. You can join Julio and myself in the Innovation Factory on Monday the 27th of June for a three-hour session that will look at the range of sustainable installation materials and how best to use them. Check out our website for more details. But first, a little bit of housekeeping. This session is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel early next week. If you would like to ask a question or leave a comment, click on the questions in the control panel and type in your questions and press send. There will be a couple of polls, poll questions. These will appear automatically on your screen and you'll be given around 30 seconds to answer. We'll have one coming up shortly. Your feedback is extremely valuable, so we will take all questions and comments on board, even if we don't have time to answer them all. And before you log out today, do remember to download your certificate from the handout section. But first, we've got a little introductory video. Hopefully that gives you a little bit of a flavour um, of the activities we've been uh, delivering at BEST. Um, but to get us straight into today's topics on sustainable installation choices, um, we'd like to introduce you to Mark Lynn. As mentioned earlier, Mark is the Managing Director of uh, Eden in, uh, Renewable Innovations and is here today representing the Natural Fibre Installation Group of the Alliance of Sustainable Building Products. Over to you, Mark. Hi Sam, thanks for that. Um, let me just. Uh, so yeah, I won't introduce myself. Sam has done a good job of that. Thank you. Um, so the Natural Fibre Insulation Group is a um, collaboration of the uh, some. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, my 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 screen's just gone a bit funny. Can you bear with me one second, please? Um, sorry about this. Uh, right, I'll start again. So, um, yeah, so the Natural Fibre Insulation Group is a collaboration of, of the main uh, natural fibre insulation brands in the UK. Uh, when I talk about natural fibre insulation, you've got flexible, so that would include sheep's wool, um, hemp, jute, wood flex, cotton, uh, rigid, which would be uh, wood fibre and cork generally, 
uh, blown, which would be cellulose and wood fibre, and then other types like straw bale. And you can see the, the, the members of the natural fibre insulation group at the bottom of the slide there. Uh, the main outputs and, and, and aims of the natural fibre insulation group is just to increase awareness, um, work collaboratively to develop the market and provide education, information, um, to really bring the natural fibre insulation segment up to its rightful place in the market. So if you look at other countries such as uh, France and Germany, for example, you know, they, they cat this category, uh, natural fibre insulation, would constitute about um, somewhere in the region of 15% of the of the market. And in the UK currently, it's a, it's a fraction of a percent. So we have a long way to go to um, to ensure that natural fibre insulation forms part of the, the overall mix. Our last point there really is the work we're doing to to input and influence policy, really from a top down and a bottom up approach, really. And you can see there a screenshot of some of the information sheets that we've provided um, through the Natural Fibre Insulation Group and the ASBP. So it's worth going on that website to see what's available. Uh, one of the things that we focus on really is, is an understanding of the multiple roles of insulation because we've been conditioned um, really over the last 20 years to see insulation in a very one dimensional way, which is essentially U values. And of course, you need to look and see what insulation insulation does uh, and the multiple roles that it performs. And when you see that, then you start to realize that natural fibers, both from a sustainability and a functional performance point of view, are the most appropriate uh, technology for, for, for many, many applications. So if you're looking at start with the, the multiple roles and you look at thermal performance, and I mentioned earlier, we've been conditioned to look at U values, but I think when we, when we look at uh, thermal performance of insulation, we've really got to look at the U value, the energy savings and the phase shift. And I'll touch on all three of these briefly. Um, energy savings is important because if you think about it, insulation, particularly in a, uh, you know, its primary focus is to save energy. Um, but when we look at the U-value, we don't necessarily see that, and it leads to a very skewed view of, of actual insulation performance. And I'll just illustrate that now. So if you're looking at U-value versus energy savings, so here we've got a cozy wood slab, so a standard sheep's wood slab. This could equally be a wood flexible wood fibre or a hemp jute product, but you know, um, I've just used sheep's wood. It's what I'm most familiar with. And so if you're looking at a 200 mil, this is on a 500 mil limestone wall retrofit internal wall insulation. To achieve a 0.22 U value, you can see you need 200 mil, uh, but there's, the, the, there's, there's latitude within the building regulations in a wall to go up to 0 0.70, and I don't think that's used as much as it, need, it should be really. And I think it's because of our perception about U values uh, that, that, that influences that and, and this is one of the barriers to the uptake of natural fiber insulation of course um, so the perceived energy gap if you're looking at a u value of 0.22 versus 0.64 you you know it's t hundreds of a percent difference in performance perceived but actually if you convert that u value into energy savings and what i mean by energy savings is is you, you take into account the energy loss from the uninsulated system and you look at the energy loss from the insulated system and you get those both from the U value and you deduct one from the other. So it tells you essentially how many kilowatt hours are lost um, through the wall per square meter per degree. Um, and you can see um, when you're actually looking at energy savings, the I've got my units wrong, it should be 18.9, not 18.9 K. And 15.2 not 15.2k um but when you're looking at the difference between 200 mil sheep's wool and, 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 and 50 mil sheep's wool the actual difference in energy savings is only about 20 percent and that backs up with a lot of people know anecdotally that essentially you get diminishing returns with insulation and that the first 50 mil really is, is is what does the land share of the of the work so when we're talking about retrofitting and natural fiber insulation we need to sort of disabuse ourselves of this notion that not, if you're using natural fibre, you need very large depths of it to get performance. In actual fact, you don't. Um, 
And I think if once we start to embrace that and understand that a bit more fully, I think um, natural fiber and retrofit is going to start taking off more. Similar principle here I'll touch on when you're looking at PIR versus um, sheep's wool. You, again, 50 mil, uh, 75 mil PIR system gives a U value of 0.3. 75 mil uh, system with our sheep's wool gives a 0.45. So looking at the U value, you think that one is 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 50 percent better than the other, but it, in actual fact, when you're looking at the energy savings, in this case annual energy savings, um, the performance gap's 8 percent. Now, when you look at the potential benefits that you get from the natural fiber, such as the the embodied uh, carbon within the material, you've got significant benefits from a moisture uh, control that eight percent is worth sacrificing for the additional benefits that you get. I mean, you're looking at the cost difference between these systems; um, they're all in the same ballpark. Uh, phase shift I mentioned. So essentially, phase shift is getting the is making sure that the the, the peak heat from the outside is out of phase with the peak heat in the inside. So if the peak heat is at four p.m really you want the peak heat in the inside to reach uh, to be at 4 a.m. So essentially assuming a 24 hour heat cycle, you're trying to get the inside and outside as far out of phase as possible. So if you're looking at this case, with uh, which helps with overheating by the way. So if you look in here in comparison with the wood fibers, you've got a phase shift for the PIR system here of uh, 6.8 hours, which means that the peak heat is reaching the internal building fabric too early which can cause overheating. Uh, you look here at a wood fiber um, example, we have 140 mil of a wood flex and 60 mil wood fiber. You're looking at a 12 hour phase shift. So basically the, the impact of the external peak heat is hitting the internal envelope at, at, at the longest part, uh, the longest difference, time difference possible, which again is substantially reduces overheating in the summer, which in, particularly in southern parts of the UK is becoming a, a, a big problem. Um, when you're looking at embodied carbon, obviously all natural fibres contain roughly 50% uh, biogenic carbon, uh, which equates to uh, so uh, basically 1.8 times the mass of the natural fiber in CO2 equivalent. So the, the, the natural materials store carbon f for their life. And this is why it's important to build in a circular attitude to natural fibers as well. So it's not just a question of using, um, you know, nature-based materials. You need to use them in a circular way and keep that carbon locked up for as long as possible. So in the case of insulation, you could be looking at 60 years plus. Now, bear in mind that a kilo of carbon saved from the energy from the atmosphere today is worth a kilo more than a kilo of carbon saved in 60 years' time, um, and that's been recognised in, in other um, in, in other countries more than the UK. Although that, that attitudes are changing, if you're looking at the uh, Rex Whole Life Carbon Assessment, it does give a value to, to the biogenic carbon. It's not 100% of the value because it recognizes that, that there is some releases um, over time. But it's important to give a value to that because it, it's, it's an important factor for um, climate change mitigation. Natural fiber insulation being one component of that, but obviously timber being another. Um, we have a database on the SBB website for the third party environmental product declarations, which are important for, you know, for the credibility of sustainable materials. Um, you can see here a screenshot of our the Thermofleece um, EPDs that we have that are publicly available on the Environdeck um, CP, EPD library. Um, I've mentioned there uh, the Rick's whole life carbon assessment and also dynamic LCA, which as I mentioned, takes into account of that carbon. Uh, humidity regulation is critical, particularly in retrofit, um, as I mentioned earlier, but it's really important to keep humidity within the system, not just within the building, but within the system, the elements as a whole, within that safe range. And the way that um, that natural materials can absorb and release moisture is re is really critical to 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 that um, to creating that. Um, so, how does natural fibre insulation breathe? Well, there's two aspects to it. One is it's vapour open, and the other is that it's sorptive. And what that means is that uh, water molecules, uh, so water vapour, which is a gas in the air. 
uh, not droplets uh, or anything like that. It's a gas in the same way that oxygen and, and carbon dioxide are. Um, that's a polar molecule, so there's um, slightly positively charged ends where the hydrogen is, and similar with the keratin or cellulose has got um, polar regions in that molecule, and basically the water molecules bind, um, physically bind to the to the natural fiber like magnets, uh, and it can be released as well. So what happens is that as relative humidity increases, the natural fibers want to increase their moisture content. And they do that by stripping water vapor from the air and binding the water molecules like a magnet. Now, if you think about it, temperature drops, relative humidity increases until you hit the dew point. So if the temperature drops and the relative humidity increases, the natural fibers start stripping water vapor from the air. And what they're doing is effectively constantly pulling the humidity away from the dew point. Now, the reverse happens when the air warms up, its relative humidity drops, and then the natural fiber starts releasing moisture back into the, um, to the atmosphere, but not to a point where you get a condensation risk. Uh, looking at uh, VOCs, so looking at natural fiber insulation as a, as a component for source control within the building fabric. So source control is ensuring that you use building materials that don't emit um, harmful um, emissions for that, that would um, reduce the quality of indoor indoor air. So if you're looking at our um, thermal fleece, so it's a thermally bonded cheap soil, um, all, all the um, quilted insulation available, natural fiber insulation is thermally bonded in the same way. Uh, total VOCs, carcinogenic compounds and formaldehyde um, beyond limits of detection really. So, and that's at three day and 28 day. Um, I've got data there for a wood fiber as well, but both these products are exceptionally low and very good um, choices for source control. In addition, when it comes to formaldehyde, uh, sheep's wool has the ability to react with formaldehyde and destroy it. Uh, formaldehyde is, it, it, you know, can be, um, prevalent in, in many properties in, in this country. We don't pay too much attention to it in the way that they do in the Far East and in parts of the US, but um, it's the smallest organic compound. It's highly mobile um, in the air and it's carcinogenic and causes problems with the upper respiratory tract and um, control of indoor air uh, formaldehyde levels is critical really. Uh, for good on indoor air quality. Uh, and, that, and the reaction that I mentioned earlier about sheep's wool and formaldehyde is really important uh, reason for using wool carpets and fabrics and stuff within the uh, occupied spaces. Uh, acoustics, so here we've got um, our Thermo Fleece Ultra Wool, which is a 31 kilo uh, sheep's wool. Uh, compare that acoustic performance with a Rockwell RW45. So here we've got the absorption coefficient. Uh, one's the best and zero's the worst. And you can see this is the absorption across a range of frequencies. And to all intents and purposes, the um, the, the ultra wool and the, um, the RW45 perform in a very similar way. Uh, fire, so Natural fiber insulation is generally uh, treated with inorganic uh, mineral-based fire retardants, so typically a phosphates or um, uh, inor inorganic, not organic phosphorus compounds, inorganic phosphates, um, uh, magnesium sulfate, um, bicarbonate of soda, and some borate as well. Um, and they char, so they react to fire by charring, uh, and they they don't work in an accelerating way. And natural fiber insulation uh, the products themselves um, almost exclusively are Class E, um, so they they're not classed as non-combustible. So where, where non-combustible insulation is mandated, then you have to act accordingly. Um, and I'm just going to finish up there with my um, contacts. So you've got me, uh, Mark at Thermofleece there, and you've got the SBP um, contacts as well. Uh, I I would certainly urge you if you want to do some some more reading on natural fiber insulation to go on the SBP website and the natural fiber insulation group because by and large you know it it is a collaboration of of, of the UK expertise um, and the one last thing I'd like to say about natural fiber insulation is that these are all tried and tested technologies so 
we're well beyond the point where using a natural fibre insulation should be seen as the risky option here. Um, you know, as I say, it's 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 a it's a, a substantial part of the mix in Europe, and it should be a substantial part of the mix in the UK. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, much appreciated. Um, and I hope the audience will be able to see there that there's a lot more to insulation products than just the U values. Um, so we'll go to our first poll of the day um, and look at something. But on a scale of one to five, what is your level of knowledge of sustainable materials in the built environment? So one for no knowledge and five for expert. And maybe Mark's in, uh, presentation there might have a, a, a little bit of a sway on where you think you were. Um, but we rest reassured that Julio is coming up with some more content shortly. Let's give you a few more moments there to submit your responses. And there we go. Most people in that middle range um, will maybe leave it to Julio and Mark to be up in that uh, top five uh, expert range. Um, but a good feel that you know roughly what you're needing to do, and I'm sure that will lead to some very fruitful uh, uh, questions, questions and answers towards the end. But thank you, for uh, Mark, for that presentation. Um, I'd like to uh, now introduce Julio Bruce williamson um, who has been working with us at BEST on some of the training content. Um, as, as I said, we'll have the in, in, in the Innovation Factory a practical session, and there's also going to be the online learning content uh, coming up shortly. But as a little bit of a teaser as to what that's involved and what Julio is going to be covering, uh, there's a short presentation on some of the, the principles. Over to you, Julio. Julio, you're still on mute. Yes, yeah, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. That, that, thanks for that introduction, and uh, and also Mark uh, for covering some of the the key elements here on uh, on, on natural fibre materials. Um, I will be talking about uh, some similar topics here, um, but also. Uh, I think it's useful to mention the the work that we're doing uh, with Sam um, and Smart uh, and Built Tomorrow with Smart Trans, uh, Transformation um, in uh, with with Zero Waste Scotland um, and looking at how these materials are 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 placed within the Scottish context and how um, how available they are. And, and what these constraints uh, that Mark was mentioning, and, and, and also some of the benefits, how the industry is uptaking these, and how we can improve it. Um, so, so obviously, this this work uh, today um, is is looking more towards the skills element, uh, awareness, um, and um, and some key elements that, that hopefully um, attendees can can take take with them and and uh, and explore further. Um, I'll be covering um, some some of the the work we are doing, um, and also some of the, the the elements that we'll be showcasing and and going more in depth in in our workshops that Sam uh, mentioned at the start. Uh, so hopefully um, some of you are are interested in in attending these. Um, I'll be I'll be I mean a lot of the work is is really around. Um, this this industry perspective. So so hopefully the next up, couple of slides uh, will be relevant to, to that cause. Yeah. Yep. So just as a as a small introduction, um, some of the current drivers really um, around um, uh, the, the the use of of, of insulation and and particularly um, natural uh, forms of insulation. We obviously a lot of our buildings, um, whether they're they're existing buildings or whether they're new builds, we've we've got this driver towards uh, energy efficiency, partly uh, driven by building standards uh, in in a, in a positive way. Also, a lot of the the targets and legislation around carbon emissions uh, and reduction of these. The introduction of uh, some of the uh, well-known standards uh, around pacifiers, for example, trying to drive that uh, reduced uh, energy use in buildings. And why not think about uh, the Scottish standard, um, looking at um, a standard that can be 
as good and, and, and possibly better than passive house in, in, in some sense, adjusted to our built form, adjusted to our, to our way of, of building in, in Scotland. Um, but with the introduction of uh, these natural materials and, uh, and sustainable materials that we've been talking about today. So we know that a great deal of this energy efficiency comes around to decreasing operational energy and carbon emissions associated to that. Um, and um, most people would associate this to the regulated uh, carbon emissions and, and, and energy use um, for space and water heating in our, in our buildings, um, lighting, any pumps and fans, etc. That, that is very well understood within the, within the industry. Um, but uh, we need to understand that there's other uh, sources, obviously, uh, unregulated through appliances and specific uh, demands uh, within uh, the buildings uh, that, we, that we occupy. So that's, that's important to bear in mind. But let's not forget about uh, today's talk and, and the, the embodied uh, benefits, the way in which materials uh, in, in a positive or in a negative way um, can add uh, or, or reduce CO2 emissions uh, from our building. So that's really important. And a great deal of that comes from our construction materials. Um, the ones that we specify, the ones that we source um, to, um, to be used in our, in our, in our, in our new builds uh, or in retrofit. But it's also uh, the means of uh, building services, a lot of the equipment that's installed in buildings that, that needs to be considered and any renewable technology out there. Um, so all that has a weight to it, all that has a carbon weight um, associated to emissions um, from that. Um, so it's important to take that into consideration. And similar to uh, Mark's uh, explanation there with the RICS, um, whole life carbon uh, approach, um, this example here of a residential building is, is quite impactful. We've got over 50% of embodied carbon emissions. So these are uh, emissions from these materials and, and within the built form that is locked within, within the building. There's also 18% of emissions in use. So that could be replacements, uh, maintenance, etc., and other elements. And, and yes, there is that operational 24% uh, carbons from that uh, um, regulated and unregulated uh, energy use um, and, and some other kind of operational um, unregulated uh, aspects. So, so, so it's important to distinguish how that big weight and that big element of uh, embodied carbon is, is so important to, to consider. And insulation plays a big part um, in the bulk of a lot of the materials in buildings, especially in, in countries uh, such as our own, where our, we have such a long heating period um, and we rely on uh, shielding ourselves from, um, from those changes in temperature, etc., and cold temperatures that we experience. So hopefully that's a good, good introduction there. Um, I want to also talk about some of the classification of different insulation materials. We are talking about particular ones uh, today with the more natural and organic uh, plant and animal based. But let's recognize, obviously, in the comparison with, with these others, I mean, we've got inorganic material ones, your glass walls, your slag, mineral walls, et cetera, um, all these, these kind of uh, rock wool type uh, materials, widely available um, at the DIY market and also um, for, for larger um, um, development and, and, and projects. Um, the same way, um, the more highly performing uh, organic ones, but these are fossil fuel derived. So let's not forget that. Um, and these are your polyurethanes, your uh, polystyrenes, uh, your, your PIRs, etc. Very highly performing in a rigid form, most of them, uh, and rigid boards. Um, and again, quite, quite widely available as well. Um, and then we've got the ones that I think we're more interested in in this talk. Where we've got the organic, uh, natural, uh, could be plant-based, uh, whether it's fibre, uh, wood or hemp, or whether it's another source of, of plant um, through, through, for example, cork, um, uh, etc. And, and also the, the, the kind of animal-derived uh, organic, sheep's wool, 
letter, for example, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, so there's, there's a wide range of these products. Um, some will be naturally sourced from this, this uh, first use of material um, for, from a, a plant-based or animal-based, and others would be have that recycled content, for example, cotton uh, fibers, um, cellulose insulation to some degree with, it, with newspaper, uh, etc. Something to put in the back of your mind, very high performing uh, research and, and uh, on insulation materials around innovative products out there, nano coatings, um, face change materials, etc. All those have a place within the market, but are obviously at that niche point, um, high end point. Um, but today's talk is, is more about the plant and animal based uh, materials. I think it's important to talk about relevant legislation um, towards this drive of adoption of, of these materials. The majority uh, is very much focused around lowering energy use, lowering that operational uh, energy use. So it's important to recognize that we need to look into the embodied carbon materials, that we place uh, some thinking and design uh, uh, specification within uh, sourcing materials that will be able to sequest or, or to absorb carbon and also will use less carbon during its production uh, and transportation to site etc so that's important and um, i mean for the more energy efficiency aspects uh, on, on energy uh, reduction we've got the technical handbooks uh, from the scottish government uh, and building standards division but also we've got uh, legislation around climate change to reduce uh, carbon through our buildings, uh, which is a, a great, great deal of, of, of elements there that, that uh, contribute, um, but very little of it talk, talking about sourcing of materials and embodied carbon. Um, but I am glad that there is that uh, discussion and set of documentation coming out um, around circular economy through Zero Waste Scotland and recognizing these opportunities, these different sectors, and, and how the economy um, can adapt itself to, to that type of, of thinking. Um, so that's important to, to highlight uh, and to consider. Um, there's Energy Efficient Scotland. There's also, um, I mentioned, the Climate Change Plan, uh, looking into that into more detail. So worth looking into these documents and thinking uh, within uh, the selection and adoption of these materials. So, so just wanted to also cover some of the, the points that, that Mark uh, talked about, um, looking more towards the natural insulation and organic and fiber uh, type uh, plant and, and animal derived. Um, majority of them have very similar properties and benefits. Um, and I would say that um, the work that we are doing at the moment um, for, for BST, uh, and Zero Waste Scotland looks at the wide range of products that are available across the UK and also those that are imported from, from mainland Europe and highlights these elements um, and these benefits. Talking about durability, that capacity of uh, being used and, and reducing uh, 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 replacement of these, they have a, their performance can be uh, tracked for, for a longer period uh, and they can withstand different changes uh, a lot of the materials. Um, fire capacity, so a lot of the materials, especially a lot of the wood fiber, high density materials tend to be very, dense uh, and, and obviously are, are able to um, slow that 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 uh, fire hazard and that, that capacity of, of fire spreading that, that quickly and that easily. Uh, they tend to char, uh, as, as mentioned before, uh, which gives that, that extra protection and that, that time to, to escape and to, to be uh, away from a, from a source of, of, of fire. In terms of health, We've got the indoor air quality benefits. Uh, we've got a great deal of control and buffering of humidity within inside of the building and also any incoming humidity coming from outside, which brings in uh, respiratory benefits to, to occupants. It brings in 
thermal comfort within the occupants. So, so it's got that ability to, to, to be very uh, sympathetic um, on, on any fluctuations of, of temperatures and, and, uh, and sources of, of humidity. So, so I think that's, it's got a lot of these benefits. We've, we understand the thermal properties. Um, they're competitive in terms of, of reducing that heat loss um, throughout the building envelope. Uh, uh, buildability, they have very similar uh, handability within, within uh, the fixings, within uh, actually placing it within our, our building components. So that's something that the industry isn't that aware of. Uh, they see it as a complex uh, way of, of implementing and using these materials. They aren't. They're just as good as others. Acoustic benefits, because of their density, they're able to, uh, to buffer the, uh, uh, that, uh, that transmission of, of sound. So, so it's got that ability there to, to, to do that, especially those materials that are, are high density and, and, and rigid. And finally, sustainability aspects, which linking to the way it can trap and absorb carbon and also the reduced uh, uh, carbon required to, to produce these from its original source. So these are some of the, the kind of wider benefits. In terms of advantages and, and, and other elements uh, linked to that, we've got that recyclability. The majority of these materials are biodegradable. And if they do happen to end in, in, in landfill, they will uh, quickly disintegrate and not uh, harm uh, or release any offset uh, uh, of any toxins uh, during that. Uh, so, so obviously it's got that, that element there. I've mentioned the, the property of, of durability, indoor air quality, where it's got that capacity of buffering humidity and controlling indoor conditions. Global warming potential, I'll go into that uh, in a bit more detail, but it's important in that calculation uh, of that impact of, of carbon emissions and how it can, uh, in a lot of natural materials, be much less than some of the more synthetic materials available. Uh, so it's important to make those distinctions. Breathability, that capacity of controlling and buffering um, and, and absorbing and releasing humidity within the, within the building component. It's, it's very important because we, we live in buildings that uh, gain humidity and also are a source of humidity. So, so we've got to be conscious of that uh, humidity traveling within our building component. And obviously linked to that are all the low carbon emissions uh, from that, from its production and also its ability to re reduce uh, heat loss within the building. But just a bit more on these opportunities, and I think this is where um, these materials have that edge against, uh, well, the benefits as well within synthetic materials available. Um, and I always relate this back to the different boundaries and the different processes of creating materials and, and using them within the building sector. Um, the, the industry divides it into different boundaries, um, A1 being that source of raw material, A2 being that transportation from that raw material sourcing towards manufacturing uh, areas, um, and, and, and A3 being that uh, manufacturing process, um, which requires energy, which requires uh, manpower, machinery, etc. Um, and some materials will require more than others, uh, depending on, on, on what sources of energy are being used. But that, that single process or those three processes are so critical in selecting materials, and natural materials provide this, this uh, advantage here, particularly in A1 on sourcing materials because of the natural content. And then we've got the other aspects of, of this kind of circular thinking. Um, around transportation to site and its actual placement within a building um, and its, its kind of construction phase onto that usage and operational uh, uh, time. And then if it comes to that, that reuse and recyclability of materials and natural insulation have, have, have those uh, properties very well marked uh, within that. So 
they're very low in body carbon, uh, the majority of them. Um, we've got that use of natural materials and um, um, healthy occupants uh, within within the use of them, both while they're being installed and also as they're being used within the building uh, envelope. Um, that uh, reduction in release of any toxins, uh, off gassing, that some of the synthetic materials might uh, might have higher uh, levels of, and that alludes to, to some of the the tables that Mark was mentioning around uh, volatile uh, compounds um, and, and that and those uh, toxins that could be released and, and, and the comparison. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these materials, you've got your wood, uh, sheep's wool, flax, cork, wood uh, derived and fibres, all have very similar uh, performance and, and, and these kind of low embodied carbon properties. Now, on to some of the challenges, sadly, and some of the barriers as well. Um, there are difficulties in some cases to some of these materials in availability. They are harder to source. Um, a lot of your retailers, for example, your B&Qs, your Wix, etc., will not have these on stock, um, sadly. They do have to be sourced from specific uh, representatives and specialists. Uh, um, which is not an issue. I mean, they, they are available, so, so it's, it's a matter of, of actually uh, taking more more uh, uh, focus on that. Um, so most of these materials are imported, um, and uh, they have to be, be sourced, especially in large quantities. Um, but there are retailers uh, out there that, that could easily uh, supply very uh, very fast. Um, there is at the moment little government support for production and manufacturing, uh, not like uh, other countries in Europe, for example, France and, and Germany. There is a great deal of focus around around this, and the building regulations link in this uh, into into uh, the sourcing of these materials and the benefits of them. So um, I think that's where government should 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 uh, have a place. Uh, but equally have a place to giving opportunities for, for production of these materials within homegrown uh, sources, uh, whether it's homegrown fibres, whether it's uh, homegrown uh, materials out there that uh, can be sourced within Scotland or the UK. Um, as I mentioned before, skills around uh, use of and sourcing of these have to be in place. Um, and, and I think this this webinar series and, and the workshops uh, are, are, are a starting point. But sadly, yes, the industry focuses on new values. And after a couple of interviews with industry members here in Scotland, that remains one of their their concerns. Um, certification uh, is is something that they're, that they're interested in, but also. Um, that comparison with their existing synthetic materials and how they can be replaced by using natural uh, materials and new values seems to be that, that kind of burden to them. Um, because a lot of the thermal conductivity values, as, as you can see in this table, are slightly higher than your conventional synthetic materials, and, and, and that's something we need to face. Some re uh, uh, research that we're conducting at the University of Edinburgh is trying to look at ways in which these natural materials can be enhanced to some degree to reach some of the lower thermal conductivity values um, in synthetic materials. So that's something we, we hope to be delivering in the next couple of months and years um, to, 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 to add to that. Um, but yes, it requires greater thicknesses of these materials to reach and compare with some of the, the synthetic materials. And just to give you a flavor of this, um, to, to end up my, my presentation, when we're doing some uh, static uh, uh, calculations of U value, which is an industry uh, norm, looking at the use of PIR as, as, as one of the solutions, um, where we've, we've got a U value of 0 0.15, wall thickness of just over 400 millimeters, and a total insulation thickness of 190 millimeters. If we compare that with maybe substituting it with a natural material, for example, hemp insulation, trying to reach the same or similar value, U value, 0 0.14, we get a, a lower U value. Um, this is more to do with the, the product thicknesses uh, available. Um, so we've, we've aligned to that. So more thickness there, we've got 
80 millimeters more of insulation needed to reach those, those similar U values um, compared with the PIR. Now, as Mark was alluding to, we can't just focus on U values. We need to think about all the added benefits that these products can, can provide, like that uh, humidity control, like the, the, the indoor air quality benefits, the, the, the capacity of absorbing heat and that thermal inertia that, that can be part of, of these materials. So um, although U value is, is important for, for meeting some of the, the compliance aspects and building regulations, let's also think about our users uh, within these buildings. Just finally, some innovative applications uh, that we've been looking at uh, within our study and, and, and this, this uh, series of, of webinars and, and, and workshops, uh, the use of straw and also um, uh, kind of mushroom derived uh, insulation. Some of them are, are very much in the research uh, in front and others are being developed as products. That's the case of the Eco Coco, um, a straw based uh, construction system. It's looking at compacting straw at a certain angle and a certain uh, direction so that they can limit uh, any heat loss, but at the same time, it's able to absorb and, and release uh, uh, humidity and, and, and heat uh, when required. Uh, that in line with, uh, with a wooden frame, uh, it can create some, some interesting uh, uh, panelized uh, systems for, for any uh, buildings out there. Um, currently, a lot of it has been done around the domestic uh, sector, but certainly uh, the material and, and the product is evolving uh, in that. And then we've got the mycelium uh, biome uh, material, which is, is a kind of experimental material out there uh, looking at uh, mushroom uh, uh, root uh, structured uh, uh, device, uh, which is obviously organic um, and, and it's got that ability of, um, of, of, of absorbing as well, um, very lightweight, but at the same time quite uh, compact in, in its way, uh, providing breathable uh, capabilities, moisture uh, control, um, and definitely that, that ability to, to stop any off-gassing and, and, and provide some better indoor air quality. Um, these are obviously controlled mushrooms, they're, they're controlled uh, uh, organic matter um, that uh, are being able to, to be transformed with these panelized uh, insulation materials, um, still experimental to some degree. And that, that's the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you very much. I, I hope you've enjoyed these, the, the, these slides um, and open for discussion and any questions if, if there's anything out there. Thank you very much, Julio. Um, just whilst the attendees are thinking of those questions, uh, I do want to flip to pool two in uh, today's running order, which is where within the built environment do you feel that low carbon learning skills can have the biggest impact? So at what stage, where, where can the biggest impact be made? And don't forget to type your questions into the chat box uh, on the screen. And there we go. So design and policy stages. So um, fairly an even split there. Um, but I suppose understanding how design and design choices can have that impact, but also the uh, role that policy and standards have of driving what the, that threshold uh, for building standards could be. So that's really interesting. Thank you for that poll. Um, I think we're going to head to the uh, Q and A section just now. Uh, so whilst uh, Julio and Mark join us on screen. Um, uh, I think there's a few questions starting to trickle through. Do uh, type them in and submit. Um, but I'll start one off uh, uh, at the moment. Um, so Julio, you touched on it briefly there. France and Germany have got had a lot more policy driven around natural insulation choices, and that is being seen in the uh, share of insulation materials used in their markets, up to about 6 and 8% uh, 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 profit moment. 
and Mark, the ASBB's own research highlights that the UK market share for natural materials at the moment is still under 1%. Um, what is what can be done to help us drive towards that higher percentage? What will allow natural material installation choices to uh, increase its market share? Um, Tommy, I'll, I'll go first there. Um, the, the, the market share in, in, in France and Germany would be higher than 8%. You know, it's, it's well into double digits. Interestingly, um, I had conversations with people in Germany and asked them how they managed to achieve that market share. I was expecting some, you know, convoluted answer, but the, the answer was quite simple. They've grown by 10% a year for the past 15 or 20 years. And that's how, that's how they've got there. Now, we don't have 15 to 20 years to get to that point. So we need other um, means of um, generating demand and also creating supply because you know it's a, it, the natural fiber insulation market in the uk at the minute it's grown in somewhere in the region of 30 to 40 percent year on year and has done for quite a while and um, but we reach a point where we need to start manufacturing more of these products domestically and that requires national and regional governments to create the investment conditions to allow that to happen i mean thermofleece is the only natural fiber that's manufactured in in the uk um you know and you know it, it it's good for our business but it's not good for the sector we need more production more capacity and this is the point as well about capacity that you know the capacity for things like man-made mineral fiber have topped out so the question for us isn't whether or not there's enough capacity to make natural fiber insulation we need to be thinking as a, as, as a country about how we generate capacity for insulation as a whole and what proportion of that capacity should be natural fiber that's really where the debate should be around at the minute and this may bring me nicely onto one of the questions from attendees uh, uh, here um with increasing demands for the lower u values in new mm -hmm. regulations how will the sp uh, bp promote natural insulation uh, to combat those already out there in the market. Yeah. Well, the, the first thing is you have to differentiate between retrofit and new build. Um, with retrofit, we need to get away from the notion of U values and start thinking about energy savings as a way of comparing products. Um, and there's a few benefits to that. One is that you can get a massive benefit from a relatively low thickness of insulation in a retrofit when you're looking at, at energy savings as the comparison and I put a slide on that showed a 75 mil system where there was a less than a nine percent difference in performance um, so we need to really when it comes to retrofit start thinking about energy savings rather than new values which is energy loss in new build I think it's a question of you know, new build provides you an opportunity to, to see measurable value from the biogenic carbon, which requires really regulation to, to, to afford more value to that. Um, and, and to get developers to understand that there are, there are many more benefits than costs to, to building deeper building fabric. And it's not a, not necessarily a negative. And the other thing, of course, is that we're not trying to convert the entire world to natural fiber insulation. The goal is that it's a, that it that is a credible part of the mix. So what we've got to do is identify those aspects of the market where natural fiber insulation gives a clear and measurable benefit as relative to any alternative technology. Fantastic, thank you. Um, and on that kind of journey of scaling up um, over the next five, 10 years, what type of uh, skills, what type of knowledge, training, development do we need to see across the UK? Is uh, Mark? Yeah, do you feel yeah. I think I think there needs to be different levels of of skills uh, and, and and definitely knowledge. Uh, gained at, at all areas i mean definitely at, at the in the industry level there needs to be that understanding of of uh, selection and uh, an appropriate uh, installation um, of these um, 
uh, at the designer end, looking at uh, those benefits and and trying to to persuade the the clients. I mean that that's where maybe architects have a big role in, in actually persuading their, their clients to to go down that route um, through all these benefits that we've talked about, um, and not just U value. Um, so looking at at, at a training at that level, and, and and it probably has to come from the root of of, of, of architectural training, um, uh, and I think also at government level. I mean, there there, there needs to be that uh, approach to um, to to exploring um, the benefits um, and trying to make them significant within the building regulations um, and, and having them placed there, having a significant placement within it. I've um, I've been in natural fibre insulation now for approaching 20 years, and I've seen a few false starts, and I've seen similar conversations started that peter out. And at the end of the day, you can take a horse to water, but you can't make a drink. And um, I think it's different this time. Uh, I think the horse is ready to drink, so to speak. And so what we've got to do is provide compelling and understandable um, information and comparisons to allow people to, to, to more easily transition. But we also need to really, I'm starting to see, I need to probably see more, but start to see more of the learning economies. You know, it's fascinating that we do a lot of CPDs to architects and particularly amongst the younger um, audience and those how little knowledge they have of natural fibers. And you're thinking to yourself, well, surely there's older people in these practices that must have come across this technology before you know where's the information sharing within within the cohorts and, and within the groups you know it really needs to start you know people just need to start learning and realizing that this natural insulation isn't a problem that's too hard to look at it's actually fairly straightforward Well, thank you. And I suppose that will lead me on to the last question uh, this morning. Um, in terms of that knowledge sharing or the way we break the circle of business as usual, um, could both of you just do a little pitch as to how attendees can go away and do one thing differently over the next weeks, months to change their practices or challenge some of the preconceptions around natural insulation choices? Julia, do you want to go first? Yeah, um, I mean, that's, I mentioned this before, um, and, and you did as well at the start, um, uh, definitely taking part in some of the workshops and and, uh, and being part of a more practical approach on, on sourcing and recognising these benefits uh, hand in hand uh, and, 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 and being up to date on, on what's available uh, there. Um, I think that's a good start. Um, and, but I think just as 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 a building designer or or, or as a contractor, etc., um, trying to really um, look at it in a, in a holistic approach, uh, and definitely look at material sourcing in that holistic approach is is, is a good start. Uh, not just insulation, but I think the whole the whole construction uh, design and, and sourcing is important. Thank you. I'd, I'd probably try to start um, questioning the true impact of the materials that, that we use. Um, it used to be that what you did was fudge the rules in your favour and then milk uh, as a product supplier. You fudge the rules in your favour and then just milk it. Uh, what we've got to do is fudge the rules in favour of objectivity and transparency. You know, that's what we try and do as a business is is to be as transparent as possible and to be as objective as possible. And then it's down to the specifiers and the decision makers to take that transparent information and make use of it. As product suppliers, we have to be transparent, but then the recipients of those products have got to be able to, to differentiate between information that's provided on one product versus the other, and rather than just taking someone else's word for it. So thank you, that a challenge to take forward after today's uh, session. Thank you both for your uh, presentations. Um, got one last poll before we uh, wrap up today. Um, what area of net zero building uh, would be of most value to your your business? So 
these webinars has been part of our Fabric First session. We've also had um, a mass timber, carbon accounting, uh, and other modules being developed. Which of these five areas would you benefit more from? As we've alluded to, this is the start of a new area of work that we're looking to expand upon, and your feedback and where you benefit most will help us prioritize where we can support. A couple more seconds to submit your answers, um, and we'll see. There we go. So carbon accounting is sitting out in the higher there. And that probably alludes to what you were saying, Mark, about transparency and understanding uh, the numbers and uh, the data that gets put in front of you and not just relying on that you value. Um, so I suppose that's us coming up. We're on the hour. Um, thank you uh, to, for joining us today um, uh, uh, and sp uh, giving us your time. Thank you to Mark and Julio for preparing the presentations and making time for us this morning to uh, share your insights on how we can uh, specify natural insulation uh, uh, materials more. Um, we have posted a few links up into the chat box on the uh, with, they'll take you to the website page on the uh, training sessions that will happen in factory with myself and Julio. Uh, and please do remember to uh, download any of the handouts, including your certificate for today's webinar uh, before you leave. Um, your feedback is extremely important to us. It helps us refine and improve the programs that we're able to deliver through uh, the funding we receive from our partners like Skills Development Scotland um, and allow us to build on uh, the work that we are starting here today. So uh, please do fill out that feedback form when you get the link through. But for me, uh, I've been Sam Passon. Thank you for, very much for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.